What happened to the dwarves in The Hobbit after The Hobbit? Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover the best in fantasy books and TV shows. The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher and much more. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. In The Hobbit, thirteen dwarves, plus Bilbo and Gandalf, retook Erebor, the lonely mountain from Smaug. This was a huge victory for the dwarven nation as a whole. For centuries they had been forced to flee before the forces of evil, Balrog and Dragon, but now, finally, they had recovered one of their homelands. Leaving aside all of the other things going on in that story, this was a massive and unlikely win for the dwarves. An entire nation had been cast from the Lonely Mountain by Smaug. Now just thirteen of them, plus Bilbo of course, had won it back. Those thirteen dwarves were soon supplemented by many more from Dine's community in the Iron Hills, and Erebor's population and economy boomed. Our attention may stay with Bilbo and his return to the Shire, but big things were happening around Erebor off-camera. Those who survived the quest of Erebor were now legends among dwarves. But what happened to them after The Hobbit? Well, let's start with the dwarves whose fate we know about in The Hobbit itself. Thorin, and spoilers here, obviously, Thorin dies in the Battle of the Five Armies. Things were not looking good until Thorin, who had been barricaded in the Lonely Mountain, charged into the action with the other dwarves. Armed and armoured with the best that Erebor's armoury had to provide, he smashed into the orc army, briefly turning the tide of the battle. Thorin led the attack, but was struck down. Fili and Kili, Thorin's nephews, stood over his dying body, defending it to the last. This act of heroism, incidentally, led to Fili and Kili's mother being one of the few female dwarf names that we know. Dis was their mother, and clearly raised them well. But Fili and Kili tragically both died in that action, and with them and Thorin's death, the line of Thrain, Thorin's father, ended. So Dine Ironfoot inherited rulership of the Lonely Mountain. For a few decades, the Erebor community prospered. They built positive relations with the elves of North Mirkwood, and particularly with the humans of Lake Town. In short, Dale was rebuilt, Erebor restored, and prosperity abounded. So ten of the original dwarves survived and presumably prospered in Erebor. But what does Tolkien tell us about what they actually did after that? Well, let's start with Balin. About half a century after Erebor was liberated, Balin led a small group of dwarves to try to reclaim khazad as well. As we saw in The Fellowship of the Ring, this was not ultimately successful. In fact, it ended in tragedy, the total wipeout of the dwarves. We probably shouldn't be too harsh on this mission, as they did manage to take control of much of Moria for several years, but still we learn about Balin's fate in The Lord of the Rings. After being declared the Lord of Moria, he went to see the Miramir, a spiritually important place for the dwarves just outside the eastern door of khazad and he was shot by an orc. I made a video about everything that happened next if you're interested in that, but his was the grave that Gimli wept over when the Fellowship passed through Moria years later. Gimli was a distant cousin to Balin, and will have known him in his youth, so this was a personal loss, as well as caring about the dwarves reclaiming their homeland more broadly. Two of the other dwarves we know had gone with Balin. This wasn't just a personal mission, it was a serious attempt at retaking khazad -dûm. Oyen was one of the two, that's Gimli's uncle. When Balin was killed, Oyen realised that the game was up and led a group of dwarves west to see if they could get out the west gate. They couldn't. It was blocked by the Watcher in the Water, that tentacle creature the Fellowship encounter outside Moria. The Watcher in the Water killed Oyen. Ori was also a part of the group and took it upon himself to record the colony's last moments, listening to the drums, drums in the deep, and waiting for the orcs to attack, in the hope that perhaps someone would find that record and learn what happened. Tolkien doesn't dwell on it, but Gimli recognises his large, bold handwriting in the book before it tailed off. It's how he learned of his death. So, thirteen dwarves on the original quest, three die in the Battle of the Five Armies, and three more in the quest to retake khazad -dûm. That leaves seven. 
Dwalin, Balin's brother, was actually quite old by dwarf standards in The Hobbit at 169 years old. Only Thorin and Balin were older, but he seems to have been quite robust. He survived the Battle of the Five Armies, and he was still around by the time of the events of The Lord of the Rings. Indeed, Tolkien tells us that he survived that too. Whether he fought in the epic Battle of Dale, which took place while our attention in the story was on Gondor and Moria, we don't know. But Tolkien does tell us that he lived through to the year 91 of the Fourth Age, at the ripe old age of 340. For reference, most dwarves lived to about 250. And Christopher Tolkien even speculated later that perhaps this was a typographical error by his father. But whether that's true or not, Dwalin clearly had a good and long life. We also know a bit about what happened to Gloin, Oin's brother, and Gimli's father. In the build-up to the War of the Ring, the dwarves of Erebor grew concerned about a couple of things. First, Balin, who had been writing home regularly from Moria, had stopped writing. All had gone quiet. Second, Sauron had sent an emissary to them out of the blue, seeking a ring of power and offering them the return of the remaining rings of power that the dwarf lords had had. Clearly something was up, and Gloin was dispatched, along with his son Gimli and some others, to journey to Rivendell to share their news and see if Elrond had heard anything about Balin's mission. Given what was going on in the world, this was quite a responsibility, so clearly Gloin was well respected in Dine's court. There he met Bilbo again, and Frodo, sitting next to him at the feast and giving him the news of Erebor and its surrounding area. It was his son Gimli, of course, who joined the Fellowship and distinguished himself so well. So presumably, Gloin himself returned to Erebor to tell Dine what he had learned, which will have helped him in the preparations for the battle to come with the Easterlings. And presumably, Gimli at some point returned to tell him what had befallen his brother Oin. Gloin died just a few years later, aged 253. A noble life. A perhaps slightly less noble life, if perhaps a happier one, was led by Bomber. You'll remember him from The Hobbit happily eating his way through, well, whatever was put in front of him, which leads us to the slightly less heroic aspect. Gloyan recounts that 60 years after The Hobbit, Bomber was now so fat that he could not move himself from his couch to his chair at table, and it took six young dwarves to lift him. Then we have the final four, Bifa, Bofa, Dori, and Nori. Gloin tells Frodo at the Council of Elrond that they are all alive and well at Erebor, but that's about all we do know, and Tolkien doesn't tell us more elsewhere, although we can probably guess. Each received their fourteenth share of the loot from the quest of Erebor, that's one fourteenth of the Dragon Horde. Just pause for one moment to remember that Smaug was lying on a literal hill of gold and gems and other treasure. Bilbo struggles to climb up it, it's so big, so we can confidently assert that they each entered their Middle Ages not just comfortably wealthy, but some of the wealthiest people in the whole world. For sixty years at least, they lived lives of comfort and ease, seemingly choosing not to volunteer to go on any more missions like Balin or Gloyan had. However, they were all still young enough at the time of the War of the Ring to be expected to take part in the battle defending Erebor from the Easterling attack. That was a hard-fought battle. Three days of close-quarter fighting, and then a siege. Many dwarves died, including King Dine. I think we can safely assume that Bomber didn't take part, but the others probably did, and perhaps one or more died defending the homeland they had fought so hard for the first time around. Sadly, we simply don't know. Other than a few highlights, Tolkien is content to let the dwarves slowly fade from view in the Fourth Age, so perhaps we should too. The quest of Erebor was a monumental moment in dwarf history, turning the tide of their fortunes in the Third Age. All ten of the dwarves who survived prospered hugely, becoming wealthy beyond their wildest dreams, but it seems not to have fundamentally changed any of them. Balin still risked everything in pursuit of a homeland he'd never known, Gloin was fiercely loyal to his family, Bomber just carried on eating, and Bifer, Bofa, Dorian, Nori seemed to have lived contented lives away from the headlines. The quest of Erebor was never fundamentally about the pursuit of gold and riches, and becoming amazingly wealthy didn't fundamentally change any of the dwarves. What mattered more was that they had their homeland once more. 
Some went off to try to reclaim another ancient home, while others stayed and defended Erebor itself. If you'd like to see more videos about The Lord of the Rings, please click on the link to the left of your screen. Or for live streams, new short form videos, interviews and more, please check out my new channel IDG Live. There's a link in the middle of your screen now. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.